Okay, so uh, good morning and uh, to the few. <laughs> uh, this is the last class, uh, Thursday class of the year. So uh, we will address romanticism in France. And um, just to summarize, it's romanticism will start later than the other countries uh, in France because uh, of the importance of neoclassicism that had really carried the revolution and the beginning of uh, the rise of uh, Napoleon. So uh, the neoclassicism lasted much longer than other countries. And therefore romanticism started a little later. And it's also going to be very different to what we had seen in other countries where uh, the, in England, as we've seen, it revolves mostly about nature, around nature uh, with Constable and Turner. And then when we go to Germany, it's uh, mainly with uh, Kaspar David Friedrich, also uh, nature, but his very own interpretation of nature. It's really that inspiration, not the um, reproduction of nature. Uh, we see that in Norway and uh, in uh, Russia, uh, nature is really the, the pure inspiration. And with uh, Ivazovsky or others, uh, it is really the celebration of nature uh, with its different faces. It can be very calm and pretty, it can be very wild, uh, but this is what they portray. So let's uh, look back Uh, look back at what was it? just worked very well in the lead now it doesn't my computer is frozen okay so uh, just an idea of uh, the French Revolution and Napoleon a few dates so don't uh, look at the distances between them if the sequence is correct. So we have the storming of the uh, Bastille prison in, on the 14th of July, 1789. Uh, the declaration of the rights of men and of the citizen, which is a very important thing because it not only went on, but it also influenced the, the same thing in the United States. Uh, in uh, August 1789. Then we have the establishment following the Convention uh, Nationale. Uh, we have the establishment of the Directoire, the Directory in 1795. And that's only gonna last for uh, four years until Napoleon decides to uh, install the consulate where he becomes the leader um, and becomes the first consul. The same year, 1799, there is the incrementation of the uh, metric system in France that's going to then uh, spread to most other countries except the UK and, as you know, the New World, the UK and its dependency. Is that where it started? Yes, 1799. It started, it was actually. Sorry, that's my mom. <laughs> so, um, the, it st they started thinking about it in 1791. I'm sorry, but I have to answer the question. Maman, je donne cours. Je donne cours, je suis en classe. Je suis en classe, maman. Okay, je t'appelle. Oui. Okay, sorry. Uh, so it took about uh, eight years to establish because they had to make all kinds of um, uh, measurements as the metric system is based on the circumference of the earth and the, the, it's part of uh, one of the uh, meridian. And uh, so I'm not gonna go into it. You can go on Wikipedia, but so it took a long time before they came to the proper measure. And so the meter, being the uh, unit for uh, any measurement and then the litter and so on and so on. 
Napoleon established uh, the Napoleonic Code of Law in 1803, which is still in vigor in many countries in uh, Europe. Uh, and then he crowned himself emperor in 1804. Uh, he had to abdicate in 1814 after, uh, under the pressure of uh, his enemies and the fact that he was starting to encounter some losses. Uh, that lasted, he was exiled to the island of Elba. Uh, wasn't there very long, a lot of people called him back and helped his escape. He came back in uh, eight, early 1815. And then it's the period of 100 days that finishes with the Battle of Waterloo where he def abdicates for good and he sent on exile to the island of St. Helena. And he will die in 1821 to uh, this year being the 200th anniversary of his death. Sorry, but I have a problem. Okay. So uh, French romanticism, as I mentioned, is, sorry, I went too far on the other one. something that's really wrong. I apologize for that. But... Okay, so what's the difference between neoclassicism and romanticism? Whereas with um, uh, neoclassicism, we saw cool serenity. If you remember, people that have shown no expression, uh, it's more theatrical movement that's going to define the, the feelings. In uh, the romantic uh, works, we definitely see a lot of emotion. Uh, neoclassicism is based on rationality, whereas romanticism is on spontaneity. We have on one side symmetry and order, which goes back to the, uh, to the Renaissance very much, whereas with romanticism, we have irregularity and irrationality. The form is defined by means of line in uh, neoclassicism, whereas in romanticism, it's by color. And we'll see that very much with the Lacroix. Uh, single color for an object in neoclassicism, touches of complementary color in romanticism, which is a premise to uh, what's gonna happen with the impressionist. And um, uh, the Lacroix will be quite an inspiration uh, for uh, uh, for the, the impressionist. Could somebody help Joan because she doesn't see very well? Just help her, guide her to her seat. Thank yes. you. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Okay, so with a neoclassical painting, uh, we have a very smooth brush stroke. Okay. And uh, where they are almost invisible, even close by, even close by, the brush strokes are invisible. So, um, with in uh, romantic paintings, uh, it's a very visible brush stroke. Uh, and very, very expressive. Uh, propriety and decorum are the subjects for uh, neoclassicism, the qualities of the subjects, whereas we've seen with romantic paintings, temperament, accident, and individual genius. So uh, the kind of subjects for uh, the French Romanticism, we have nature and natural landscape, though very little, but mostly hero and heroism and nationalistic struggle. And this is very much due to the fact that they are just coming out of the French Revolution. They are right now the second, I mean, I can't say the second Republic because there were others in Italy too but they are one of the few republics in Europe. Um, and uh, so for them, that's their, their pride. Uh, 
We find some foreign influences, definitely English poetry with Wordsworth, uh, Coolbridge, Lord Byron, Shelley, and Keats. Um, the German literature was Schiller and Goethe. Uh, music, Beethoven, Brahms, Mendelssohn, Chopin, and Liszt, and opera, Wagner. As far as the French romantics themselves, uh, the influence is really Rousseau in French literature. Rousseau, who was talking a lot about return to nature and the idea of the noble savage. And we'll see some examples of that. In literature, we have uh, the big names, um, Chateaubriand and Alexandre Dumas' uh, son. Uh, poetry, Lamartine, Victor Hugo, Alfred de Vigny, Alfred de Musset. In theater, again, Victor Hugo, particularly with Hernani, which was uh, very motivating and very controversial um, uh, opera, um, play when it came out. And then in music, uh, Berlioz and Gounod. This is a very good example of the kind of mood that you can imagine in the romantic world. I'm not talking painting particularly, but this is really a, a funny painting for me, uh, where you have this being on the piano here with Marie Dagou, uh, literally sitting at his feet, uh, enjoying his beautiful music. And then you have a whole series of important figures uh, seated Alfred de Musset or Alexandre Dumas, we're not sure, uh, the, the father though, uh, Georges Sand next to him in this uh, armchair. And then uh, standing, uh, we have uh, Paganini, uh, Rossini, and um, Berlioz. And so this would be the kind of mood of his romantic salon where they would have this extraordinary music and people are just completely, you know, entrailed in the, 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 the whole idea of, of that romantic movement. And then we have Beethoven's past on the piano. So just uh, the timeline. I'm bringing in uh, the neoclassical David, of course, David, who is the uh, main uh, representative of uh, neoclassicism in France. Gros, who took over his uh, studio, his workshop when he was exiled to Brussels. And Gros, who we'll see again, is constantly, has that inner battle between neoclassicism because he wants to follow his master and all the value of neoclassicism, but his soul is romantic. And he will have that uh, battle until he dies. Agro, who follows very faithfully David and is very neoclassical, though becomes very stale because of it, because at the time he, they run out of inspiration and it becomes just a formula. And then we have transition people like uh, Proudhon, Giraudet, who we will see. Uh, Bro, if we consider him uh, a transition figure too. And then the very first romantic is the Géricault, who will unfortunately die very young at the age of 33. Uh, but he's really the promoter of uh, the romantic uh, movement in France. And then taking over shortly after that is Delacroix, who has a much longer career and uh, who is going to really be the central man in uh, the romantic movement. And I just put as a reference Monet because Monet is going to uh, know very closely the work of Delacroix. And in a sense, all that very spontaneous brushwork comes from that kind of painting. So we talked about the uh, he was born in Cluny in 1758 and traveled to Italy. Um, in 1882, 1802, sorry, his wife was coming to, to asylum. And it's an interesting story. She was extremely jealous. And when he painted the Empress uh, Josephine, he was, she was absolutely convinced that he was having an affair with her. 
And so she made a big fuss and right away she was taken to an asylum, uh, insane asylum and was committed there. And he was given the custody of his children. In 1811, he's named professor of the Empress Josephine and um, becomes member of the Académie des Beaux-Arts in 1816. Um, as soon as his wife had been committed, uh, a young artist who was working with him, uh, Mayer, uh, who became his companion for 19 years, um, took care of his children. And when his wife died in 1821, she was sure that uh, he was going to marry her and he didn't want to. He refused to marry her and she committed suicide. Uh, so this marked her very mar marked him very much, and he died actually two years later. Uh, sorry, I didn't translate that sentence, but the Lacroix saw in him uh, one who could resist the ideas of neoclassicism and uh, went on with the romantics uh, who are going to make of him uh, their martyr. He started with some works that were neoclassical. And this is a, a very pretty little a miniature uh, showing that he copied some uh, frescoes that were found in Pompeii. And um, this was a motif that was uh, repeated very much at the time with the neoclassical is the idea of the selling of Cupid. And the Cupid sellers, guess what? This is just a symbol, an allegory for prostitution. It's the selling of love. And uh, so what you see is the woman, she has some Cupids in a cage and she just gets them out just like poultry <laughs> and sells them to who comes by and wants it. Uh, so this is uh, his version of a painting on I miniature on ivory. But he's going to depart from that uh, pretty quickly. And uh, one of his early uh, success was this painting that was commissioned for the Palace of Justice, Justice Palace in Paris. Um, and the success was most probably about the content of the painting. What, uh, Proudhon describes himself as under the dark veil of the night in a wild and remote place. The greedy criminal murders his victim, snatches his gold and looks to make sure there's no sign of life to betray his fearful deed. He does not see that nemesis, that terrible aid to justice is pursuing him and is about to seize him and deliver him up to its unyielding assistant. And so what you see is that beautiful allegory of crime and punishment, literally, uh, where you have Nemesis and his assistant there and the criminal going away. Uh, this is uh, often been interpreted as the first crime of humanity, the murder of Cain and uh, Abel. So uh, this is, of course, a perpetual uh, late motif, you know, you start with Cain and Abel, and then you just go on with uh, uh, the Emperor Caracalla, uh, who would be uh, one of these uh, horrible people. And then it became a caricature, and the criminal became the head of Napoleon. And they considered Napoleon had uh, committed enough crime against humanity that he became, in a caricature, the criminal. So the painting was installed in the Palace of Justice in 1809, was presented in 1810, but uh, when the empire fell, then the painting was given back to him. And uh, it was held at the Museum of Luxembourg uh, from 1818 until 23 when it entered the Louvre. He painted Josephine, and this is the famous painting where his wife became very jealous. Josephine was a very uh, attractive woman, and uh, it's really uh, quite interesting the way uh, he paints this. This is still has its roots in the Rococo period of the 18th century. Uh, 
with the pretty landscape at the back and the, the lovely feature of that woman. So whereas uh, his subjects are very often early on taken from the antiquity, but then uh, just the gentle folds of the cross and, and the little faces and so on are still a little bit inspired by the Rococo. So you see here the, the study for the painting. He's a very pretty draftman. And then here uh, she is in that uh, uh, beautiful nature. So once uh, Proudhon was separated from his wife, the Napoleon gave him an apartment in the Sorbonne because by that time they, they had been expelled from the, the Louvre where artists typically had their studios. Uh, but uh, because the Louvre was turned into a museum, artists didn't have the place for it. And this is where they did their painting. And this is Constance Meyer, uh, the uh, art student who was working uh, with him for a while and who became his companion once his wife was committed. A uh, very pretty girl, as you can see, but she was a very depressive character. Um, we assume that the, the painting that you see on the left was painted by Proudhon. And it's incredible how it exudes the love that she had for him. You can really see that, read that in her eyes. I think it's absolutely beautiful. Um, but then the miniature was probably painted by Constant Meyer, who was a very uh, good artist by herself. And this was supposed to serve as a lid for the a tobacco uh, box for her father. But after Constance died, the miniature was uh, uh, taken off the, the lid and then was put in that pretty frame and Proudhon painted the two grisailles on either side of them. So unfortunately, when um, Proudhon's wife died, as I said, uh, she, uh, she was so disappointed that he didn't seem to want to marry her. It literally seized the razor that was next to, to him and uh, cut her own throat and died. And this is one of the last painting he did, the crucifixion which is a, a marvelous work um, that really shows the, the actually the, the chagrin that he had, that, that pain that, uh, that he had after uh, she, she died. He didn't realize actually how much he was fond of her. And you have that extremely, actually, I think very modern representation of the Christ with just the body, you barely see the face, but you see the strain of the body hanging on the cross. So a very sincere work with very deep shadows. So the other uh, transition, transitional artist is Anne-Louis Giraudet and to have his full name is the Roussy Triosson because um, he was born in uh, 1767, but two, 20 years later, he lost his parents and was adopted by the Dr. Triozon and decided to add the name of his adoptive father to his own name. Uh, he started at the school of David and then uh, in 1789, he won the, the Prix de Rome and lived in Italy for uh, four years. He painted a lot of portraits of Napoleon and his family, but did also book illustration. And then uh, he uh, inherited some money from uh, his adoptive father and uh, decided to stop painting and did mostly some illustration. And he started publishing some poems, which apparently were not good at all. <laughs> he was particularly interested in unusual color effects uh, and the problem of uh, contrast between light and shadow. This is uh, one of the first portraits he did. This was the only child, other child of the Dr. Triozon. 
And you can see that romantic mood in just that pensive face with the beautiful curly hair. Uh, quite an interesting representation of Benoit Agnès Théozon. And here comes an interesting painting he did of the uh, belly deputy, de deputy for Saint-Domingue. Uh, Saint-Domingue being uh, San Domingo, uh, just next to Haiti, uh, was uh, at that time the possession of France. And uh, the, he was one of the first representative of uh, Saint-Domingue uh, at the National Conven Convention in France. Now we have to look at him. He is standing, he has the uniform of the convention member. Uh, there is a tropical landscape behind him and he's quite stylish and has that pause where he's leaning uh, on the, the uh, pedestal uh, that on which is the bust of the philosopher Guillaume Thomas Renal who was the author of a philosophical and political history of the settlements and trades of the European in the East and the West Indies. Renan, that you, who's your, um, you see the bust, uh, had just died and he had been one of the big supporters of the abolition of slavery. So when you see a painting like this, uh, we can look at it on the first level and say, this is an interesting representation of obviously a black man who was by the way, born in Senegal and had been taken to Haiti Saint-Domingue at the time as a slave, was able to um, buy his own freedom and then had become quite uh, instrumental in the revolt, the Haiti revolt where the, the uh, slaves uh, revolted against the owners and became it became the first uh, country owned by slaves by ex slaves. Now, an interesting point would be if you look at this it, at the second level, you can remark that uh, the breaches are uh, showing a rather consequent male member, and this might look funny to us to think about it. But it is uh, at that time that was the image that the noble savage was also extremely well, uh, how this equipped, if you want, <laughs> and um, and but this was part of that whole image of the noble savage, that um, normally a white man would not show that much advantage. So all these we have to read because it is part of the image that they wanted to show. So uh, it's still, he's part of that native population of the time that is uncivilized, but uh, he shows some other sides of civilization. He was on the national convention for two years, then lost his uh, seat and uh, went back uh, to Saint-Domingue and was deported from there uh, and uh, was deported and died three years later. So there was uh, that whole part of the, the insurrection of the slaves and then the comeback, it was not a, an easy uh, thing. So uh, quite an interesting, he was a captain of infantry and fought against the colonists again, was six times wounded. Another interesting figure is uh, um, Kachev, uh, that Dahut, the Christian Mamluk. Uh, we have to realize that after the fragmentation of the Abbasid Empire, the military slaves that were known as a Mamluk became the basis of the military power throughout the Islamic world, and particularly in Egypt, by the way. So uh, even in France in 1801, uh, the general uh, Jean Harp was sent to Marseille to organize a squadron of 250 Mamluks, and then it was canceled and reduced to 150 men. Uh, finally, it ended up with uh, the three officers and 155 others. Uh, they were organized in the company that was attached to the Imperial Guard. Um, 
they were trying to get uh, their independence, but it was a, a problem. They tried to uh, call on onto even the Tsar to try to get their independence, but it never worked. And this is that very Orientalist figure, and we'll talk about Orientalism in January, uh, but that attraction to the exoticism of the, the exoticism of, of the figure, not only but attire. And it's just a wonderful portrait, I think, by Gibaudet of that Christian Mamluk. Giraudet tried himself at uh, allegories and illustration of um, literature. And we've talked already about Ocean, uh, who is that uh, narrator and supposedly author of that cycle of epic poems that were published by the Scottish, Scottish poet, uh, James Macpherson uh, in 1761. And that took off though the origin of what Macpherson was pretending that he had found some uh, uh, these, he had actually transcribed some oral tradition in Gaelic and so on, uh, is very doubtful. But anyway, it took off the interest in these poems that were going back to Scottish tradition, uh, became extremely famous in Europe and became source of inspiration for many painters. And this is one of Gihode's uh, representation of ocean receiving the ghosts of fallen French heroes. So it's a kind of an adaptation of these Scottish old tales to a French contemporary subject. Uh, so it, is, it has been described as being very bad taste where he can't quite leave the neoclassical period and he kind of brings in some kind of fake and doubtful uh, imageries that, that doesn't work. Yes, John. And why do we have all these women but that, that's part of all that world that turns around ocean. You should, ocean, you should really go and look at it. It is so intricate. It's a series of a whole a series of poems with different figures that come in. And none, it's not a story. It's not a narrative. It's a series of little stories that are bottled up. And he, it's almost like he regrouped some of the stories that he read and that, uh, adapted that to a French subject, which is the, the French heroes. But this is where uh, that's probably uh, what you would call the weakness of Giraudet, who doesn't uh, really bring the, the total strength into his work. It's a little easy type of narrative. Yes? Uh, are the heroes recognizable figures? Or but you, you have a feeling actually almost to see Napoleon here. But I assume he had, you know, these are more or less representation of different officers that would have died uh, by that time. This is 1805. So you have already the, the Battle of the Pyramids and, and all the battles that where some of the heroes uh, died. But Ocean is really an interesting, interesting phenomenon because we saw some uh, in, in England, I think it was Blake that made some illustration of Ocean or Fuseli. I don't remember one of the two. He also made some uh, allegories showing uh, the young actress, Mademoiselle Lange, uh, as Venus. And she didn't care for that representation because <laughs> in the mirror, all she could see was one ear. And so she didn't like, actually, he's showing the proper angle for the mirror. Uh, for us, this is all we could see. She might have seen her whole face, but we couldn't. And so she really uh, resented that, uh, that uh, description and so refused the painting. And so he painted the second one for Mademoiselle Lange as Danae. And then you see her here with the shower of gold where Jupiter is uh, changing himself in gold to, to approach his victim. And that one she liked. He did also a lot of illustration of works and this is part of 
the tragedy, the illustration for the tragedy Andromac by Jean Racine, uh, who was a, a big French playwright uh, at the time. And a very pretty work, but again, we have that mostly neoclassical work, but with a little feeling of romanticism over there. As we mentioned, the, the great uh, follower and the one who took over uh, the workshop of uh, David is Antoine Jean Gros. What an interesting uh, figure. Uh, he was born in Paris to a miniature painter and uh, entered the studio of Jacques-Louis David, who was the, the biggest painter at the time. That studio produced a lot of great painters, by the way. He left uh, to Italy in, 19, in 1793. Uh, and then in Genoa, uh, met Josephine de Beauharnais and who introduced him to Napoleon Bonaparte in Milan. And he was asked, Napoleon had asked uh, David to follow him in his battle so that he could paint part, you know, his glory in, in his success. And David considered that he was too old to do that, but he said, take Gros, Gros is a really great painter and he's gonna go. And this is how for a while Gros is going to follow Napoleon and uh, we'll see some of the works he did uh, with that. Uh, he came back to Paris in 1799. In 1808 was named Baron of the Empire by Napoleon. So it's a Baron Gros very often you will see as a signature for him. Uh, he will decorate the dome of St. Geneviève, who was one of the new big churches in Paris uh, between 1811 and 24. And in 1835, he just, not only his style was losing track with the customer base, if you want, but uh, he also was suffering from that constant uh, tension in him between the neoclassicism and the romanticism by, uh, he was so faithful to his old master who had inculcated in him that, that idea of neoclassicism and all the values that he um, couldn't quite follow the, uh, the romantics who was far more his temperament than neoclassicism. And unfortunately he threw himself in the, in the same river and was found drowned on the shores of uh, the Seine in Meudon. In his hat, a paper said, tired of life and betrayed by last faculties, which rendered it bearable, he had resolved to end it. And that was found in his hat floating on the, on the river. His early works, uh, this is uh, really one of the, the, the first success that he had shows the um, poetess Sappho at Lucati, uh, where she decides to finish her life. As she's, you can see her, she's in the progress of throwing herself in the sea uh, where she's going to die. Um, the painting is ultra romantic when you see that. It's that touch of light and the whole idea of suicide is very much of a romantic uh, theme though the subject is still neoclassical as it goes back into antiquity. Uh, you have that touch of moonlight and then the, the, that kind of haze on the sea. It, it's a really nice painting. And when we talk about Sappho, uh, she is now considered a, the symbol for female homosexuality. Uh, the term lesbian comes from the island of Lesbos on which Sappho was living. And, uh, but in fact, in her own time, she was not considered at all as, a, as a having contacts with her female peers, but rather be a promiscuous woman altogether. Uh, so things have uh, kind of changed. So on the, the poem that uh, was written by Lamartine, one of the, the French uh, poets, it says that the dawn was rising, the sea was beating the beach. So said Sappho standing on the shore and beside her on her knees, the girls of Lesbos leaned over the abyss and gazed at the waves. 
fatal rock, deep abyss. I approach you without fear. You go to Venus to steal her victim. I disregard that love. Love punishes my crime. Oh, Neptune, your waves will be sweeter for me. You see that flowers I have crowned my head, my head with. See this forehead, so long charged with my boredom, adorned for my demise as for a party, for the solemn headband sparkles today. And uh, so this is uh, the painting that was inspired by the works of Lamartine. But as I mentioned, he was uh, known to be close to Napoleon and uh, the, the painting you see on the left is actually a preparation study for the uh, Versailles portrait that you see on the right. Uh, Napoleon uh, historically hated to sit for painters. He didn't think that his uh, resemblance was important. He just wanted his character to be shown. So he said, if I have a a blemish on the face or a, a shorter nose or whatever, I don't care. What I want to show is how courageous I am and how this and this and that. So he wanted his qualities shown, not especially his resemblance. Though Gro was very attracted, so was David, because he had very classical features. And so they were quite attracted by that. Uh, the thing that you see here upon the the bridge of Arcole, uh, is one of the first big victories of Napoleon during the Campagne d'Italie, the it Italian campaign, and became one of the almost standard uh, representation of the young Napoleon. Of course, very known too is the Napoleon visiting the plague victims at Jaffa in 1799. This episode dates back to the Egyptian campaign um, where again, uh, Gro was following Napoleon and is really here the glorification of Napoleon. When you look at Napoleon there in the middle of people that suffer from the plague, he's almost like a Christ figure coming to help the people that are suffering from the plague. It is uh, very much also an, an example of the interest in the uh, Orient that was instigated uh, by Napoleon during this type of campaign. So Napoleon began with an army of 13,000 men, 1,500 were reported missing, 1,200 died in combat, and thousands perished from disease, mostly the, bubon the bubonic plague. Uh, when he uh, was unable to get the fortress of Acre uh, in the Middle East, he came back uh, in May towards uh, Egypt, but in going by Jaffa, uh, what was he seen here, uh, a lot of his soldiers, as you can see, were suffering from that terrible disease. Now, don't forget at that time, nobody knew what was causing the, the plague. It's only at the end of the 19th century that it will be discovered that it's actually a flea, contaminated flea, which causes the, the, uh, the plague. But at that time, uh, they thought it was very contagious, which it wasn't. Uh, so it was really the contact. And as you can see, Napoleon is coming and touching this bubble uh, that uh, the, sorry, not the bubbles, the, uh, the bubble the uh, under the arm of the, the man and his officer behind him is trying to keep him from doing so because he thought it was contagious. And of course, that's a very noble gesture of Napoleon who is trying in a sense to heal that soldier who is dying of the plague. Uh, there is a whole series of cameos where you can see uh, the fire that of the city that has been uh, taken over, and then some doctors taking care of some victims. Some doctors were interested because uh, they see some blind people, just like the one there on the extreme right. Uh, there were a lot of people suffering from eyes, eyes problems uh, um, during that campaign because of the, the sand. 
uh, in Egypt and that would uh, come and really contaminate the eyes. Now, the real story is the fact that uh, Napoleon, when he left, decided to have all these people, these French people there that were dying of the, the um, uh, bubonic plague to be killed by opium, to make sure not to have to carry them with them. And so, in fact, these people ended up dying of uh, uh, through opium uh, take and uh, died. So the, the the real image of the hero is kind of marred by the by the reality. This is another of the uh, paintings that Gros did during the uh, Egyptian campaign, uh, showing Napoleon at the pyramids. And as you can see on the other side, you have the defeated Mamluks uh, that are begging for uh, mercy. And in the background, you can see the pyramids shown by Napoleon. So these are these large paintings that the public would really be interested in. Uh, this was still the summum for any painter to do one of these large history painting that was establishing them in, the, uh, the, in their career. Okay. But yes. At the time, how, was, how were these uh, works that showed Napoleon as a savior, the hero? That was show. beautiful propaganda. But, uh, where are they shown? Here today. Oh, that they would be at the Louvre. Oh, they yeah. would be shown at the Louvre. That was a museum at that time. Napoleon is the one who started the, the Louvre as a museum. So that these paintings were shown there and would be seen by the public. It was open to the public. So this was beautiful propaganda. This was showing him as that, that great hero. And the hero, he was up to a point. This is magnified, you know, a hundred times. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, all the paintings with Napoleon's are pure propaganda. We have to realize. He, um, Gros was also quite a, a lovely um, portrait painter. He is Madame Pasteur, a young woman that he met in Naples. He also painted some uh, soldier. This is the Honoré Charles Baston, Comte de la Riboisière. Uh, who um, became an, an important figure of the uh, administration of Napoleon. But there we see again the interest in the, the textures of the costume, as well as the expression uh, on the face. He painted the um, dome of Saint Geneviève, the church that you see there, which had been started under Louis XV, but that had uh, finally uh, finished uh, at the end of the 18th century. And then finally, he painted this painting, which is the departure of Louis XVIII from the Palace of the Tuileries. Uh, when Napoleon came back from Elba, uh, Louis XVIII was already, uh, had been, had replaced him already. And so when he came back, Louis XVIII had to leave. And this is the representation of Louis XVIII leaving at that time. So before I go to uh, Theodore Jericho, I give you five minutes to stretch your legs, get some coffee, and then we'll move um, to Jericho, that wonderful painter, and then to De La Croix. So take five, if you have any questions on the, on uh, Zoom, please ask. You can unmute yourself, I'll mute you at the end. Yes. Yeah, go. No, no, no problem. Okay. So, any questions? Is it part of the romanticism of it that these uh, artists depict themselves so 
Beautiful. They were handsome. The, the one that you've handsome. seen, you will see that, that for example, uh, Delacroix is not as handsome. Yeah. But uh, Gros and uh, Jericho were very handsome. They were men. Yeah. Really handsome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No question online there? Saha, are you back from Flagstaff? Actually, I'm in Flagstaff right now, and I had my calendar dates mixed up, so I was trying to plug into December 7th lecture and finally ah. realized it's not December 7th. It's, <laughs> it's, I was so upset, I thought, is Anne sick? Where is she? Zoom lets me in, but she doesn't show up. Oh, dear. You can put some light if you want, Francis. Francis, you can put some light on if you want. So I'm so sorry I missed last week and the week before last. Oh, uh, yeah. No, there was nothing. Well, before that, door, uh, no, the Karach, Karach, uh, the Karachi's followers is next week. Oh, so the she, followers uh, was the last class. I'm okay. so confused, back and forth. Okay. <laughs> it's so confusing. You mean today? For lunch? Yeah, I just come out to the club and grab my feet if you want to go. Otherwise, sure, I'll go get my haircut and do a bunch of other stuff. I'm with you. Okay. <laughs> so, are you cold, uh, uh, Joan? Are you cold? Are you cold? I'm cold. Yeah, because we. It's we, my fault. I mean, I mean, I mean, you should always say something because it's difficult because it looks too cold. And so, we go in Taiwan and then it feels quite cold mm -hmm. uh, You should always. Something nice in the night. Yeah, because right now I'm sure they don't keep a lot of people, but the temperature. So I'm wrong. I feel like I can't dress in the morning, and I have. Yeah, I just have to be wrong. Yeah. Jericho is beautiful. What a handsome man. Yes, he is. But better up. The uh, it's interesting because uh, when you see Vigny, for example, Alfred de Vigny was also a very handsome and that, that poet. So you have a whole series of these guys were quite handsome. They're pretty. They're yeah. Pretty. Yeah. No, no, I agree with you. You know, handsome. Yeah, but that didn't exist so much at that time. You have that more in the Middle Age when men were very physical. But at that time, they were maybe doing horseback, you know, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't do big exercise. So the features, typically, unless it was genetic, wouldn't be very male. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. So this was a romantic period, shows people, you know, they, they typically romantic, the curly hair, and they, they have that soft, soft, soft yeah. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. He has a beautiful nose. Yes, very much. Very, very noble. Nice, yes. And I want his hair. <laughs> <laughs> Not we all. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> I want the hair. Okay. And why this, you know, the uh, and Louis thing? Why is it a woman? No, but that's, that's typically French at that time. They had, they, they are, many um, men whose names start with Anne and then Jean or something that French is still nowadays they have often uh, what you call non composé composed names of two names my father was Jean Jacques my brother is Jean Philippe but at that time they also used Anne or Marie because it's the fact it was Marie the mother of Jesus you know they were all Catholic names so they were all patron saints. 
for them. So Anne would be the mother of Mary. And so it was good to have that name. So you have, yeah. And my, my nephew is Jean Maximilien. <laughs> he ends up being Max. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, could you turn off the lights? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to mute you guys and we can talk. Have you? What is it? Okay, so we go on with Theodore Jericho, who is quite an interesting uh, figure. He was born in uh, 91, 1791 in Rouen, entered the uh, Ecole des Beaux-Arts uh, in 1811, and then enrolled in the army for a few months in 1814. Uh, after the abdication of Napoleon uh, in 1816 to 17, he traveled to Italy and discovered Michelangelo. Uh, traveled to Italy uh, in 1820 and 21, discovers Constable, Turner, and Stubbs. Stubbs being mostly for his horses. He was a horse lover, uh, Jericho. In 1824, already at age 33, he is weakened by riding accidents and chronic tubercular infection. And I'm not gonna say the third thing yet. Uh, also other problems. Uh, he died in Paris after a long period of suffering. And it, it's just, you all said how handsome he was. And look at the last self-portrait of his. It's just absolutely frightening. He had uh, about a year long uh, period before he died. And he was just the, uh, terrible by the end. And that was related by other people that they, they really saw somebody who suffered so much before dying and who looked so bad. He became, uh, he was in love with horses. He had um, gone to, to uh, some places uh, where they, they were raising horses and he had access to, to them and really studied their anatomy, their way of, of walking and working and it became himself an absolutely passionate writer. So this is uh, one of the portrait of an officer of the Imperial Horse Guard charging. This is so different as representation that what we have seen up to now, when he makes a portrait or when he makes some paintings, there is a different slant to the way he presents his object. And this is so much more romantic uh, than just somebody standing without emotion. And so here, what you see is that kind of man against nature, giving a lot of energy to the painting, a strong diagonal, which is always a character of uh, lack of equilibrium and therefore of energy, because something is gonna follow. If you see yourself standing on two feet, you're very stable. You can stay like that forever. Stand on one feet with the, head, the, the hand like this, you feel you're going to either fall or you're gonna come back. So there is energy within your, uh, your position. So this shows uh, very quickly the influence of Rubens, the Flemish painter on him. And you can see how he is uh, being inspired by the work of uh, Rubens but makes it a contemporary subject instead of having uh, either a Roman or antique subject. Same thing with this painting showing the wounded uh, cuirassier leaving the field of battle. Uh, there is no way any wound on that uh, soldier there but it's that implied uh, idea that he's leaving the battlefield. So he has lost. But again, there is a lot of movement involved into that representation with the, the horse re, uh, semi rearing 
and him looking backward with the fear in his uh, face. This greatest painting was, of course, the Raft of the Medusa. Um, and don't believe that I have an old image of the painting, but unfortunately the painting suffered from uh, a layer of bitumen that was put on it that darkened and is irreversible. You cannot uh, clean it. It normally would show far more colors than it does. So this is an accident, artistic accident, if you want. The, uh, this shows the commitment that uh, Jericho had for social justice. And this is a contemporary subject. It's something that happened during his lifetime. On July the 2nd, 1816, the uh, ship Medusa hit a reef in the west coast of Africa. Uh, the captain was at that time a political appointee that hadn't been in charge of the ship for 20 years when he was given uh, that uh, rank. And when the ship started uh, drowning, the uh, sinking, the crew and him took the six lifeboats and left 146 passengers without food nor water. And uh, these people had to, in a hurry, build some raft, and only 15 of them survived. This became, um, the, the ship was left adrift for uh, two weeks. When the uh, survivors uh, arrived, they told stories of cannibalism. Uh, Jericho went and talked to the survivors and made sketches of the dead and dying in morgues and the hospital to be very realistic in the rendition. So literally went around and, and took, uh, sketched some people that had died um, in the morgues and in the hospital. When you look at this, this is a, a very beautiful composition. You have a double triangle. So you have one here and then one here. That's a C that is, of course, in the total uh, energy, if you want. And then the very far there, what you see, and that's what they gesture to, is a little, little ship at the horizon that they try to attract the attention of to come and save them, which is actually what happened. They finally were rescued, but only 15 out of 167. So what he shows, he doesn't show cannibalism there, but he shows a lot of people that are on the point of dying. Um, when it was presented at the Louvre in 1819, uh, the first time it was hung much too high. You know, you had different levels to which you could hang the painting and it was hung much too high so people couldn't even see what it was. And it was not understood at all. They said that uh, the author must not have uh, believed that he uh, should talk about the nation, uh, neither the condition of his uh, figures. Are these Greek or Roman? Uh, are they Turks or French? Uh, under which sky are they navigating? Uh, at what time of the ancient uh, history uh, or modern history uh, does this come back, they, the, this report? And so they could not understand exactly the story of it and didn't have as in anybody that uh, would understand. Though the, that uh, terrible story of the Medusa had been published and had be, become a real, um, how can I say, really a scandal uh, because it was a political scandal as that captain wasn't able to do his job. And uh, so uh, finally, when they understood, he decided to take his huge canvas and exhibit it in, in uh, England where it was much better received and understood because a little pamphlet had been printed since uh, telling the story, and so people did understand what it was about. So this is the first time really where you see the ugliness of the world. And this is really uh, quite uh, 
an interesting representation with quite a respect for the truth as he went and interviewed uh, lots of people. Lately, a copy of the Raft of the Medusa has been redone and you can find it in uh, Rochefort in France. This is more or less the way it would have been built. And this was one of the early uh, studies that Jericho had done of it, but they're showing cannibalism. Uh, and then of course became, he realized that would have been too much for the public to see. And so the final work didn't show the cannibalism. He pushed the realism to getting body parts in his studio, which apparently was stinking, you can imagine. So uh, he did some studies, as you can see, parts of legs and arms uh, that he painted uh, to make sure that he had everything looking real. And as I said, people that were coming to his uh, workshop would, would the studio were horrified by the, the terrible smells. As I said, he was passionate um, by horses. And here in this Epsom Derby, uh, he shows what was the belief at that time that when the horses were galloping that their feet wouldn't touch ground, which of course was dismissed uh, once you have the work, I find his name in a hurry, uh, of a Muybridge, Edward Muybridge, these, these studies at the beginning of uh, photography where he uh, put cameras at uh, equal distance from one another and have them triggered all at the same time when the horse went going by, that proved that the horse always has one foot on the ground. And from that time, all the paintings by Stubbs and these paintings by Jericho were proven wrong. He also uh, went to uh, Insane Asylum, and these are two portraits that he did of people that were in these asylum uh, patients and uh, uh, victims of social trauma and so on, and uh, quite interesting studies of characters. You think of Goya and his uh, exposure to Insane Asylum. Unfortunately, as uh, I mentioned, he actually uh, fell from a horse for the X time uh, and fractured 14 vertebrae and uh, was paralyzed for a year before he died. Though some people now say that he also absolutely loved women and he was, he was very handsome, I assume they loved him too, and uh, that he also uh, had contracted the venereal disease which was current at that time. So, but the main figure of Romanticism is Eugène de la Croix, uh, born in 1798 in the Ile de France. He got, he was from a very good family and a lot believed because he looked very much like him and because he, he became his protector that he was actually the son of Talleyrand who was a very important political figure. Um, he received the classical education and then started his training as all of them did uh, with the neoclassical style. And then he looked at the beautiful works of uh, Rubens and Jericho and his style changed. And then he met Barmington that I showed you some uh, months ago uh, who decided to initiate him to watercolor and wash. And Barmington had these marvelous, was a great uh, paysagist is a landscape artist, but also taught him English, which is interesting. And so he went to England in 1825 and discovered Shakespeare and Goethe uh, there. And he visits uh, Sir Thomas Lawrence, who was the, one of the court painters at the time. Traveled in 32 to Spain and North Africa, which is gonna be a huge, huge, um, had, will have a huge impact on him because it will make him discover a different light 
is if you go to Spain or if you go to North Africa, you know how different the light is in South of Spain, Southern Spain and in uh, North Africa. And also the exoticism of all the people and the, the cities were very different. In 1862, participate into the creation of the Société Nationale des Beaux-Arts and died the year after in Paris. Um, in is buried as many of these artists, by the way, at the Père Lachaise Cemetery. Yes. Oh, no. Ah, okay. Um, he also did lots of illustrations of the works of Shakespeare, Walter Scott, and Goethe. One of his first work, uh, made in 1822, uh, is the uh, Bark of Dante. And this work is, is uh, quite interesting. Again, he's trying to make a name for himself. And so he has to do that history painting. That's all, every one of them had to try to do this. And this is of course showing Dante and Virgil uh, on their way to, to the hell, Dante's health. And uh, uh, quite interesting, you see, the influence of Rubens down here again. This is inspired by the uh, the um, the works that he did for uh, Mary of Medici. All these figures in the water. And then you had the city on fire. The back. So uh, quite uh, interesting uh, painting that is supposed to show a rather. Uh, how can I say, intellectual process, but shows uh, at the same time a lot of energy. Also, you can see the big difference with the neoclassical in the way he applies paint. You have very bright reds and the, all the colors are very saturated. And he really plays, it's the color that defines and not the line anymore. Another political subject is the massacre at Chios, where uh, they are horrified by the massacres that are perpetrated in Greece by, uh, the, by the Turks. And so this shows uh, that family decimated uh, by the Turks uh, in Greece and literally a genocide. So this is one way for him to uh, then on to denounce uh, what is happening there. A great uh, representation of face of that woman and that emotion into her. One of the largest and probably the most decried painting that he did is the famous Death of Sardanapalus. Uh, this is that uh, inspired by the works of uh, Lord Byron. Um, so this is really <laughs> the apotheosis of cruelty. Uh, it shows uh, Sardanapalus who is uh, going to commit suicide, but he decides before he commits suicide that he wants all people that around him that he loves, uh, that are close to him, even the animals, horses and, and dogs should be, should kill themselves or be killed. And this is what you see, all his concubines that are around there are being massacred before he finally commits suicide. Now, when he made that painting, it was really badly received. Uh, the people, uh, said this is a, a mistake of a painter. Uh, is the worst uh, painting of the Salon at that time. Uh, but he wasn't willing to shock his peer, but trying to convince them of his genius and the idea of the reference to the past. It's still that, that battle that you find at that time that you had to still look at the past. And for him, that was quite an interesting uh, episode. So here you can see his studies for some of the main figures. Hmm. 
more contemporary, finally, is the um, Liberty Leading the People. This is, of course, very iconic painting of his showing the, um, the commune, which was that uh, internal revolution in Paris in, on the 20th of July, 1830. Uh, this is really that uh, representation of France, Marianne here, bare breast, walking, holding the, the, the new French flag, and followed by people that were revolted against Louis XVIII. And this is all the idea showing the, the social virtues of republicanism uh, that were really uh, trying to go against the abuses of a king that had promised that he wouldn't be abusive, but he ended up being anyway. Very interesting too, is you see on the far right, the towers of Notre Dame that were very close. Notre Dame was very close to being burned. The Archbishop Palace that was just next to it was burned to the ground, but they managed not to uh, contaminate the, the cathedral. Very much an example of the, the, um, the, the spirit of the French at that time. You have the young, temp, you know, uh, drummer at the front, which was typical. Very often you had these 10, 12 years old that would drum and really give the beat for the soldier to move on. And so this is what he represents. And what you see in the back, you have the middle class guy with a rifle and a top hat, but then behind you have the, the worker uh, with the, the, the sword and some other uh, weapons. So it's a mix of the population very large allegory. He also did some uh, frescoes, the Apollo slays Python, actually, this is probably a canvas, yeah, all mounted on canvas uh, and then applied to the ceiling. And then did some wonderful portraits. Uh, I love these Paganini on the left. This is so modern in concept. Uh, he's uh, the Frédéric Chopin in the middle is beautiful. And then his own portrait on the right. And you can see the, 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 the fast brush working, very spontaneous, very visible, the, the beautiful highlights in the face. He also did, as I mentioned, some illustration. Uh, this is part of the uh, Faust trying to seduce Margaret in Hamlet and Horatio in the graveyards of both Shakespeare and Goethe. And he also had the love for the horse. He, he loved everything that moves and we'll see far more of him when we talk about Orientalism. But these are some of the, the studies of, of, of animals just incredible energy in the, the words. He also would visit the zoo in Paris and he did it together with his friend, the, the sculptor Bahi. So this is one episode where they, the same day they uh, sketch the lion and one is the lion killing a serpent and Bahi does the lion bitten by a serpent. Uh, but uh, Bahi is a specialist of animal bronzes. The tension of the muscle, these big paws, that is this beautiful. The young tiger playing with his mother. This is the Jardin des Plantes. And then he is going to do a lot of works. And these are part of the, his visit of North Africa, where he's going to see a lot of people on horses you know, the Arabs uh, and the Moroccans and so on were very good riders and would go for hunts uh, in the, the neighborhood. So this is the lion hunt, directly also inspired by um, Ruben's lion hunt. But he also did some interesting still lives. This is the nature, nature morte or so the 
still life with lobsters. It's just wonderful with that big landscape at the back. And then beautiful flower bouquet. We will see much more about the Lacroix in January because we will touch Orientalism, Orientalism being that uh, interest in the Orient and the exotic, uh, not only in North Africa, but also in the Middle East. And we'll see a lot of the Lacroix, but also Ivazovsky and other uh, painters that were quite interested in the uh, exotic. So uh, this is, will be on January 13th. Uh, I'm going to um, bring back the group. I'm gonna stop the recording first.